screen. Good day, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to present to you a series of three experiments that we conducted at the University of Vermont in the laboratory of Dr. Paul Kinstead. Uh, these experiments were conducted in collaboration with the cellars at Jasper Hill and with the help and guidance of Dr. John Hughes, who is a geologist in the uh, Department of Geology at, uh, at the University of Vermont. So uh, I'd like to convince you all that crystals on cheese are, are really cool. Uh, if for no other reason than crystals in general are really interesting. Uh, and I think they can tell a great story that can be really compelling for consumers. And, and I'd like to, to make this case and hopefully convince you of that over the course of this talk. Uh, and on, a technical, on the technical side, crystals may impart grittiness on food if they're sufficiently large. Uh, and in cheese, this can either enhance the texture or diminish uh, the desirability of the texture, depending on how big the crystals are and how much grittiness they impart, whether it's a, a subtle kind of flavor enhancer or, or uh, kind of a, a sandiness. That, that really makes a difference, especially in a market like the one in the US, which is uh, so driven by uh, texture in particular. And of course, if, if we ever want to gain any control over this process, we need to understand a little bit of, of the chemistry of, of how this works. So a crystal is a solid with a long range, uh, repeating three-dimensional atomic order. And this is uh, differentiated from amorphous solids like a glass, which doesn't have that uh, long range atomic order. And, and this is important for us in our research because the instruments that we use to visualize these crystals, both optically and, and non-optically, uh, actually use that long-range atomic order uh, to differentiate the crystals from the background material. And cheese is also uh, largely an amorphous uh, solid or a semi-solid. And so we're able to see the crystals with various tools uh, against kind of a, a blacked out background uh, in, with a lot of our instruments. And this is key to how we study these crystals. In order for crystals to form, uh, first of all, you need the atoms and molecules that make up that crystal to be present in your system. Without those uh, prerequisite atoms and molecules, even if the conditions are ripe, you won't get crystal formation. You also need supersaturation, which is something I'll briefly explain in the next slide, and nucleation, which is the, the complex and mysterious process of the initial formation of a crystal seed. Uh, which is something that's not totally understood yet, but is really important uh, for getting a hold of how many crystals form and how large they eventually form. Uh, so supersaturation can be summarized with this graph here, which is the, uh, what's called a solubility curve. In this case, it's for the, the mineral struvite, which uh, appears in washed rind cheese, as I'll cover it later. And you can see that as the pH uh, of the uh, whatever uh, substrate you're talking about increases, uh, the solubility drops off very, very quickly, uh, which means that if you uh, start off with a pH of around 5, you have a certain amount of, of compound that can be dissolved in your system. If the pH rises, you find yourself in the supersaturated zone, and the system will try to equilibrate by uh, uh, basically removing from the system the excess uh, to get back to that uh, equilibrium point, and that excess will be in the form of, of crystals that kind of drop out of solution, and that's really the... Uh, what's needed to be known about that concept. Um, in cheese, the, the way that we uh, understand this uh, phenomenon so far has really been through research that was conducted almost entirely on lactic style cheeses, camembert in particular, both in France and in the United States, uh, using various techniques. Uh, and the current model shows that these cheeses start off relatively acid, around a pH of, of 4.6. And over the course of aging, uh, the metabolism of the surface mold raises the surface pH in the first uh, top few millimeters to above seven or around seven. And this change in pH induces supersaturation and causes crystals to form underneath uh, the rind of these cheeses. And at the same time, there is a diffusion of additional calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium that occurs from the center of the cheese out towards the rind. So calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium become concentrated in the rind, and the amount of those elements in the center is diminished. Uh, I won't talk about this phenomenon too much. I'll focus really on the crystal formation. But from a, a cheese technology standpoint, if you're changing the concentration of calcium, in particular, anywhere in your cheese, this has massive implications for texture development, especially softening. And that's really what the original research aimed to figure out, how this mechanism works. And, and this will be one of the contributors to softening in addition to elevated pH. 
In our uh, series of experiments, we looked at two other cheeses. One is a, an elastic paste bloomy rind cheese, which is a bloomy rind that starts off with a, a significantly higher pH, never really dips below five. It was thought that the pH gradient and this whole mineral, uh, this whole element diffusion really wasn't very important. So that was one of the cheeses that we wanted to look at to see if there was any homology between the lactic uh, style cheeses and this one. And the other one is the, the washed rind cheese, soft high moisture uh, surface ripened cheese that uses a bacterial smear instead of the surface fungus. And these are two classes of cheese that really haven't been investigated in any serious way. And we've just largely assumed that because they're all surface ripened that they all function in more or less the same way. But you can see there are very important phenotypic differences both in terms of extent and type of, of softening on the cheese on the left and of course the, the surface but on the cheese on the right. Uh, washed rind cheeses of this variety often also have a, a grittiness associated with the surface which we at least in the beginning, thought were associated with, with crystals. That was the initial hypothesis. Uh, and so that presented an opportunity for us to try to figure out, well, well, what is that? And is that part of this whole crystallization diffusion system? So in the first experiment using our, our uh, uh, Moses sleeper, the, the high pH Blumi rind cheese, uh, we followed the formation of crystals in the top few millimeters of the cheese over the course of aging. Those crystals appeared on around day 10, were a bit more numerous on day 14, and, and were a bit larger on day 18. And we took it to day 18 because that was more or less the same time frame that the experiments using the lactic Blumi Ryan cheese extended for. It should be, it's important to note that 20 microns, 20 to 30 microns, according to the research that I've read, is more or less right at the threshold of, of sensory perception for grittiness of particles in food. Uh, and I've never really, in any of my sensory analysis, experienced any uh, discrete grittiness associated with these cheeses, even though I'd read extensively that, that crystallization phenomena were associated with them. And perhaps the small size of these crystals, and I suspect they don't grow much larger than this even over extended aging, is why we don't really experience the grittiness associated with these cheeses. But we wanted to figure out what these crystals were because that was something that hadn't been done in the previous research. And so we used a technique called powder x-ray diffractometry, which is somewhat of a complicated technique, but what needs to be known is that uh, this technique, in this technique you can take an x-ray spectrum, which is what's pictured here, of a bulk material, and if you see discrete uh, and large peaks in that spectrum, those peaks indicate the presence of crystals and based on the location of those peaks along the x-axis and their relative heights, you can actually determine what those crystals are, what the chemical nature, the chemical uh, composition of those crystals are, if those crystals had been uh, indexed in the past, if they'd been discovered in the past. And I'll show you what I mean. So on day one, we saw this kind of uh, hump-like background, which is just the amorphous material in the cheese, playing havoc a little bit with the background of the spectrum. But by day 18, we see these very distinct peaks forming throughout our spectrum, and we index those peaks against the, the database of known diffraction patterns. And what we found is that the crystal that formed in the top few millimeters of our, of our high pH Blumi Rhine cheese was a clay mineral called brushite, which is a calcium phosphate mineral. And in hindsight, actually, we weren't so surprised to find this because there's plenty of calcium and phosphorus in our system. And brushite tends to form at a slightly acidic pH once the system is supersaturated. So this is an ideal candidate, and, and, and the data uh, really show that. We tracked pH changes over the course of aging for the first 18 days of this cheese. The red is the pH of the rind, the blue is the pH at the center, and you can see that actually there is a relatively important but fairly small pH increase compared to the lactic cheeses, which get up to around seven or more. Our pH by day 18 got up to around 5.6, while the pH at the center uh, stayed relatively stable or perhaps had a bit of a dip, uh, perhaps from some post-acidification, for the most part was, was more or less stable. When we graph the concentration of calcium uh, in the rind, pictured here in red, and in the center, pictured here in blue, the first thing that we notice is, number one, that these graphs are highly correlated, that the increase in surface pH appears to be the driving force, or at least strongly correlated with the increase in calcium concentration. It appears that the uh, system that we saw in the research related to the, the lactic Blumi Rhine cheeses is somewhat analogous here. But just like the increase in pH, 
the relative increase of calcium in the rind and the subsequent decrease of calcium in the center, the magnitude is smaller. So it seems like everything is just slowed down in this cheese, which probably reflects why this cheese lasts a little bit longer and is a little bit slower to ripen. We graphed calcium in the same way, calcium concentration in the rind, in the red, and in the blue, in the center. We notice the same thing, highly correlated, pardon me, with pH, uh, the increase really happening after day seven, uh, with a subsequent decrease in the concentration of phosphorus uh, in the center of the cheese, and this would also be important for, uh, for texture. So in summary, there is a modest increase in the pH of the rind of these cheeses, which was previously not thought to be terribly important. And this is sufficient to uh, increase the rind pH uh, and induce supersaturation of the clay mineral brushite and induce crystallization of brushite. But the brushite crystals are very small and don't seem to impart any surface grittiness on this cheese, which reflects my experience uh, consuming these cheeses and, and doing our sensory analysis. In the second experiment, we looked at our soft surface ripened uh, washed rind cheese, and in particular, uh, looked at the, uh, the surface smear, that bacterial layer that appeared to us to have a strong, gritty texture. And the first thing that I did is I put this under our microscope that allows us to see just crystals. It's a, what's called a petrographic microscope, often used in geology. And what I saw is actually an abundance of crystals. All of these uh, specks and smudges and shapes, each one of those is a crystal. The largest among them are uh, longer at their longest axis than 200 microns. A micron is a, a one, one thousandth of a millimeter. It sounds small, but that's actually well above the sensory threshold, and so it makes sense that this has a gritty texture associated with it. We wanted to figure out what those crystals were, so we employed a technique called single crystal X-ray diffractometry, which is a technique that's been used actually to win many Nobel Prizes and was actually instrumental in, in solving the structure of DNA. Uh, and we took our crystals, and in the typical way that this instrument is used, mounted them at the end of a filament, loaded that filament into our diffractometer, and after collecting data for uh, about 12 hours, we were able to, what's called, solve the crystal structure. We could determine not only what atoms were present, but how those atoms were bound together. And, and this is about as much chemistry uh, about a crystal as you could possibly want, and was uh, incredibly important for helping us understand why these crystals were present. <coughs> And the crystals that we found uh, were two crystals. One was called icaite, which is a, a hydrated calcium carbonate, basically a special form of, of chalk, calcium carbonate being chalk, a hydrated calcium carbonate, meaning the water molecules are part of the crystal structure. And the other one was struvite, which is a, a magnesium ammonium phosphate. This is a bit of a more common mineral, but the thing to really point out about these two minerals is that they contain very important metabolic gases. Carbon dioxide, here this is uh, CO3, which is the dissolved form of carbon dioxide, which upon dissolving in the cheese apparently uh, exceeds the solubility sufficiently to be incorporated actually into a solid crystal if you can get your mind around that, a gas contributing to a crystal. And here we have NH4, which of course is ammonia. And so we see that ammonia, which is a byproduct of microbial metabolism of, of proteins in the cheese and is important for raising the pH. And, and that whole story seems to also be directly related to the growth of, of these large crystals in the washed rind cheeses. The other thing that we have is uh, calcium in our icaite crystal and magnesium and phosphorus in our struvite crystal. And that makes sense because there is an abundance of, of these elements in cheese and it would make sense that they uh, are involved in the crystallization phenomenon. Struvite is, is an interesting crystal. It's, it's pretty common and it's associated with what's called, uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, uh, biofouling, which is something that occurs kind of in pipelines and, and is associated with blocking them up, especially where there's a lot of bacterial activity producing ammonia. Um, and in water treatment plants and those type places, this was largely viewed as a nuisance. Um, but in recent years, as phosphorus has become more and more of a, a valuable and dwindling resource, this was actually viewed as a valuable source of recoverable phosphorus and something that's now mined for phosphorus from these biofoul systems. So struvite's kind of a cool mineral in that sense. But the mineral I really want to focus on is icaite, which is a very special mineral and is exceedingly rare in nature. This is a picture of a diver swimming with a, a column of icaite that's growing from the ocean floor in a fjord in Greenland, so where the, the temperatures are sub-zero, 
And uh, in fact, eikite has been observed in nature in few places other than those sub-zero Arctic marine environments. So here we have those eikai crystals growing uh, many meters from the uh, sea floor in the fjord in Greenland called the Eika Fjord, from where eikai gets its name. Uh, and here we have a, a very warmly dressed diver uh, investigating these minerals because they are fairly uh, strange and special and trying to figure out how exactly they form and, and what's the idea, probably taking something like a pH measurement uh, at the surface. And these are crystals uh, that were extracted from ice cores from sea ice in Antarctica. So this is a mineral that's really associated with cold ocean environments, and in fact, many authors call it the cold carbonate because it's been thought to really not occur anywhere other than in these freezing environments. So really weird to find on cheese and really awesome. <laughs> um, are crystals getting cool? I, I think they are. Um, and uh, actually, on the first day that I arrived at this conference, I got an email uh, indicating that our manuscript uh, which contained our structures for Ica and Struvite, which to our assessment are the best structures of Ica and Struvite that have ever been uh, at least submitted for publication, was accepted into the uh, a publication that we titled Minerals and Food Crystal Structures of Ica and Struvite from Bacterial Smears, Smears on Wash, Rye, and Cheese. And this is actually going to appear in the Canadian Mineralogist, which is a geology journal. So we're on the map. I, I think this is the coolest thing. And, and you know, the geologists and mineralogists that I uh, presented this data to also at a meeting before submitting this, uh, this, this manuscript uh, at the American uh, Geological uh, Society. They just loved this stuff. You know, everyone's asking us, well, you know, you found eikite and struvite, but when are you going to find diamonds? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> the second part of uh, experiment two was to go back to our microscope images and to try to figure out, okay, we have two uh, minerals that are, that are present. How can we figure out which one is which? In other words, this large mineral, uh, this large crystal right here, which is probably the crystal that's responsible the most for the grittiness, is that eikite or is that struvite? And we actually found in our preliminary data that looking at things like the optical properties, the types of colors that the crystals appear like underneath the microscope, and confirming that by picking out those crystals and using our single crystal method, we could actually differentiate between eikite and struvite and get an idea of, well, which one's the important one when it comes to texture? And it appears that eikite, at least in the, the handful of cheeses that we looked at through this method, is the more important mineral at the moment, is more abundant and grows more. So eikite is both more interesting and probably more important for us in our system. So in summary, we found these two different types of crystals that grow fairly large on the surface of, of washed rye and cheeses. And then we identified these as eikite, which is that hydrated calcium carbonate, and struvite, which is a magnesium ammonium phosphate. And these, two, these crystals, especially eikite, are very unexpected on the surface of cheese, and it's just such a cool find. In experiment three, we replicated uh, experiment one, as we did for the bloomy rye and cheese, to try to figure out the ripening mechanism and how the formation of these crystals affects our ripening. In particular, I wanted to understand when and how the crystals form in the bacterial smear, which is the layer that's associated with this grittiness. The first thing that I found using microscopy is that crystals really didn't form in the cheese underneath the smear. It was associated with the bacterial smear uh, in that layer above the curd. And we took this experiment out a little bit further because these cheeses are actually aged a little bit longer. We took it to 10 weeks instead of 18 days, so significantly longer. And over the course of that trial, we found that by week three, which is the first week that we could have enough smear to actually scrape off, crystals were already present as these small crystals, 10 to 20 microns, again, just beneath the sensory threshold. By week four, crystals were still more or less around that range. But by week five, crystals had grown to over 100 microns, one-tenth of a millimeter, which sounds small, but again, is well above the sensory threshold. By week six, those crystals were above uh, over 200 uh, microns at their longest length, which again, is quite large. And by week 10, the crystals were even larger still and, and more numerous. Just like in experiment one, we graphed pH at the surface, which is in red, and at the center, which is in blue. And uh, we found that by week three, there was a very large increase in pH at the surface, in the top few millimeters. And uh, this kind of tapered off over the course of aging and, and more or less stabilized towards the end of aging with the, uh, the center of the cheese catching up over time. When we graph the concentrations of calcium in this system, 
pictured here in red is the concentration of calcium in the top few millimeters of the rind, and including that smear layer. And we found that there was a very significant increase in the concentration of calcium in the rind. And that was accompanied here in blue by a significant decrease in the concentration of calcium at the center. But we took an additional data point. We took a scraping of that bacterial smear and just tested that in isolation. Again, we could get our data starting at week three. And we found that the concentration of calcium in the smear was many times higher than the concentration of the composite rind sample, which really confirmed what we knew, that the action was really happening in the smear. Um, and that, that's where the crystals form. That's where the calcium is accumulating. We looked at phosphorus and magnesium as well. And again, here we see steady increases of phosphorus and magnesium in the rind, steady decrease at the same time in the, uh, in the center. And when we take those surface measurements just of, of the smear, we see that most of the action is happening uh, on, on, in the smear layer, in the bacterial layer, and, and not just in the composite uh, rind sample. And this is a fairly interesting finding. In conclusion, we, in summary of experiment three, uh, eichite and struvite appear to form just in the bacterial smear and, and not in the, in the cheese below. And the crystals grow very large by the sixth week, uh, which is well before the, the peak uh, consumption for these cheeses. So they're already quite gritty, uh, even uh, towards the end of their cave ripening. And, and this can impart a distinct grittiness. You can get an idea really early on in relatively for these cheeses in the ripening. And uh, finding the, the crystals and seeing all that accumulation in the smear in particular was really important because it's, it's just one more thing that differentiates the washed rind cheese, the washed rind soft uh, surface cheese from bloomy rind cheese, which obviously doesn't have that surface bacterial layer. But there's an, an added element of, of bacterial activity uh, and the physics of, of crystallization and diffusion that's happening there uh, that's really not analogous in, in the bloomy rind cheese. And that might explain why surface grittiness is, is so prominent in some washed rind cheeses, whereas it's really not something that's very common or, or associated with bloomy rind cheeses. And so the take home message from this preliminary research, which I hope will continue in one form or another, uh, is that when you're dealing with soft surface ripened cheeses, whether it's bloomy rinds or washed rind cheeses, chances are you're interacting in one way or another with a crystal phenomenon. Uh, this can be kind of overt and cause grittiness as it does in, in the case of the washed rind cheeses, or it can have an important impact on where calcium and phosphorus moves about in the cheese over time, which, which has uh, kind of downstream impacts on curd softening. And in the case of uh, the, the washed rind cheeses, I think that because crystals in part actually directly influence the texture of these cheeses through imparting grittiness, it's particularly important to understand how these crystals work. And we already took the first step by identifying what they are, which was somewhat surprising. And in further research, I think it would be interesting to understand how different parameters of cheese manufacture and affinage affect how these cheeses function, how they form, how large they grow, how abundant they are, and, and therefore how they impact the grittiness on the surface of these cheeses. And right from the get-go, I think it's important that we take something as interesting as, as this phenomenon that's just weird and unexpected, but, but very obvious in, in, uh, to a consumer who would taste the grittiness of this and, and really highlight it and show that these cheeses are extremely special and, and have some uh, you know, really neat science that uh, I think can make a lot of people enjoy this cheese even more, if, if that's possible. <laughs> so I, I, in uh, closing, I'd just like to give uh, gratitude to uh, the folks at the cellars at Jasper Hill for uh, countless cheese samples and many hours of, of just sitting and, and chewing through these things and trying to figure out how they work and why they're important and why we care. Um, to my uh, major advisor, Dr. Paul Kinstead, uh, to our collaborator, Dr. John Hughes, uh, to the USDA Hatch Grant that funds my research, to the National Science Foundation Grant that purchased the uh, X-ray instrumentation, and of course to you for being such a great audience. Thank you. <laughs>